Welcome back, everybody. We're going to talk here about the walking causes of postoperative fever. And this is going to be DVT and pulmonary embolism. Now, the management of these things, certainly the diagnosis, but the management as well, is very, very similar to how we approach these things in the general population. But there's one important thing, and that is that fever is not going to be the most salient symptom in these disorders. So you're not going to think, oh, the patient doesn't have a fever, therefore they don't have a DVT or they don't have a pulmonary embolism. There's going to be other symptoms that I'm sure you can already imagine um, that's going to tip you off to this. Um, so we will go through that. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. All right, so we've already talked about wind. We've talked about water. Now we're going to talk about walking, which is deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. And I got a little extra for you. Uh, we'll talk about superficial thrombophlebitis, um, which is another thing that we can see in the general population. But typically, those are going to be people um, who have not gotten surgery. Um, but we will talk about that as well. Now, again, remember that there is a lot of overlap here. And these days, post-operative days, one to three, three to five, four to six, that's when you see it the most frequently. And you can expect that on your exam, it's going to be in that range. But in clinical practice, in real life, you can't just say, well, it's day eight, they can't possibly get a DVT, or it's day five, they can't possibly have pneumonia. It doesn't work like that. So you have to bear that in mind. These are the times where it's most common, but it's not the only time when these things can happen. Um, so important for test purposes, but it's a little bit more complex in real life, as is usually the case. And I know I get a lot of people who, you know, uh, write comments on my videos saying, oh, well, in real life, this. Yes, I get it. But, you know, the focus on my vid of my videos is on exams. So I try to keep it uh, tailored towards that. So we're going to talk about DVT, pulmonary embolism, and then, as I mentioned, superficial thrombophlebitis. Now, the risk for a post-operative DVT varies depending on the type of surgery that you got. Naturally, orthopedic surgeries that cause you to be immobilized is going to have the highest risk because immobilization is itself a risk factor for DVT and therefore pulmonary embolism. So hip and knee arthroplasty, just by nature, it's going to keep you immobilized. My grandma had a hip replacement done a couple years ago. She's, well, she was at the time 96 years old. It's amazing she made it through, uh, but she was immobilized for quite a while. I didn't think she was going to make it. She made it through. She's still alive and kicking. She's turning 98 in a couple months. So uh, there's one, hip and knee arthroplasty. Invasive neurosurgical procedures, major vascular procedures, and thoracic surgery. And that's kind of going in descending order. Now, in gynecologic, urologic, or general surgery, uh, pharmacologic thromboprophylaxis, as we're going to get to, is not indicated if it's a minor procedure. So if you're talking about a healthy 19-year-old who goes and gets their appendix taken out laparoscopically, they're up and moving around after 24 hours, these patients are not going to need heparin, okay? Um, but that said, they are at some slight risk because they did have a surgery. So um, in many cases, we do some prophylaxis, uh, namely make sure they're up and walking, maybe do some compression stockings, pneumatic compression devices, and so forth. Uh, but just bear in mind that not all surgeries have the same risk, and some of them have a quite low risk. Now, DVT in the surgical patient is going to prevent very, pre present very similarly to DVT in the general population. The risk factors are all the same. If they've got a factor V Leiden mutation, if they've got cancer, if they're on oral contraceptives, if they smoke, if they're older, they're going to be at higher risk. 
the surgery itself, though, is another risk. You should be familiar with Verkaus triad. These are sort of the risk factors underlying the pathophysiology of a DVT. So if there's uh, vessel wall damage, if there's stasis, i.e. they're immobilized, or if they have a hypercoagulable state. Symptoms of DVT, leg swelling and pain is the big one. A lot of times this is not described as a throbbing or stabbing pain, rather more of an achy, crampy pain. You can see some warmth and edema of the skin over the leg, which is usually where this happens. It happens in the lower extremities, not in the upper extremities. Um, it can, but usually that's associated with a cancer or something. Um, this occurs just because the, the venous blood gets backed up, increased hydrostatic pressure causes edema. Um, phlegmasia cerulea dolens and phlegmasia elba dolens literally means painful inflammation that's blue or painful inflammation that's white. This is a sign of a very severe DVT. And there may or may not be a fever. Um, so again, fever is not a sine qua non. If they don't have a fever, it does not necessarily mean that they don't have a DVT. There's Homan sign. You may have learned this if you went to medical school a little while ago, like me. We were taught that this is an important sign. Now they say, nah, it's not really that useful. Risk of DVT can be estimated with the well score for DVT. We'll get to that. That's different from the well score for pulmonary embolism. We'll get to that as well. This guy named Wells, he really enjoys this topic, I guess. Uh, so for diagnosis, uh, we do this Wells score for DVT. If the score is less than two, you start with a D-dimer. If the D-dimer is elevated, then you move on to the duplex ultrasound. Uh, but if the Wells score is two or more, then you just go straight to the duplex ultrasound. As we're going to see in these surgical patients, they're pretty much always going to have a Wells score of more than two, or two or more. Um, so here's why. So you have a surgical patient. Uh, well, right away, they got one point because uh, they had a surgery within the last three days. Uh, and usually they had general anesthesia, right? Um, and actually, that's within the last 12 weeks. So if they're bedridden in the last three days or if they've had a surgery in the last 12 weeks, that's one point. Uh, now, all you need to do then is have one more of these. And if we're suspecting a DVT, it's usually because we see some sort of sign. So whether that be swelling, whether that be edema, um, if they've had any kind of, uh, of, of previously documented DVT, it's very easy to get to two, okay? Very, very easy to get to two. And so on the exam, go with a duplex ultrasound. Don't monkey around with the uh, with the... Uh, any kind of blood work. Uh, you know, you can get a D-dimer, especially if you're on CCS, but uh, on the exam, the best next step is going to be uh, to, to go ahead and get a duplex ultrasound to look for the DVT. Prophylaxis depends on the patient's risk. So if they're very low risk, like I said, that 19-year-old coming in to get a laparoscopic appendectomy, otherwise healthy, just getting them up and walking is enough. Now, can you do compression stockings or pneumatic devices? Sure, it doesn't really, I mean, a pair of socks, what does that cost, right? Not gonna set anyone back. Uh, if they're low risk, we go for mechanical prophylaxis. Usually that's gonna be the pneumatic devices. Uh, if they're moderate risk, you can heparinize them. So that can be low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin, or you can do mechanical prophylaxis alone, uh, just tailor it to the patient. And if they're at high risk, then you do both. Now, if you've got a, a, an established DVT, so you did your duplex ultrasound, you found evidence of DVT, then the treatment is unfractionated heparin. And that's recommended uh, because it's got a very short half-life. And so patients that have had surgery are at risk for bleeding. And so if they start bleeding, if there's complications, we want to be able to reverse that. If we gave them low molecular weight heparin, uh, like Lovenox, enoxaparin, you can't reverse it. So by giving them unfractionated heparin, yes, even though they're there's worse side effects of that, we can reverse it. And that's really useful. So we use protamine, by the way. 
Um, now, in non-surgical patients, the treatment for DVT, we would go for Lovenox, uh, or I'm sorry, Xarelto, Rivaroxaban, uh, and that's a, 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 an oral therapy. So a little bit different. Um, so go for unfractionated heparin in a surgical patient with an established DVT. Now, pulmonary embolism is one of the most common causes of sudden death in hospitalized patients, and it is a complication of DVT. So look for very similar uh, risk factors, post-operative being the big one, obviously, um, or if they have any kind of history of DVT or PE. Uh, it's, again, the symptoms are going to be very similar, especially if they have a concomitant DVT. But if it goes to pulmonary embolism, then naturally they're going to have pulmonary signs like pleuritic chest pain. That's important that it's, you know, that it's pleuritic in nature. Uh, they can have respiratory distress, dyspnea, tachypnea, tachycardia. And certainly if this is a severe pulmonary embolism, they can get jugular venous distension and even hemoptysis. Lab findings are pretty nonspecific. For diagnosis, there's really no single definitive test. If you have any reason to suspect that you're dealing with a pulmonary embolism, if you've got uh, dyspnea, certainly dyspnea in conjunction with what may look like a DVT, go straight to spiral CT. That is not the most accurate test. You may be asked about that, especially in step two. Sometimes they want you to differentiate the best uh, next step from the most accurate test. So they're not always the same. The most accurate test is pulmonary angiography, but we don't monkey around with that. So you're gonna get a spiral CT. Now this is a well score for pulmonary embolism. So it's different from the well score for DVT. So if they have DVT features, that is three points. And if they had surgery in the last four weeks, that's one and a half points. So four and a half points, that already puts you in the pulmonary embolism likely. Um, so there's another, um, there's another way we can go about this as a simplified well score. Um, so keep a very, 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 uh, high index of suspicion for pulmonary embolism. If you've got a DVT patient and they start, uh, if they start saying, yeah, I, I'm having a hard time breathing, go straight to spiral CT. Do not waste time because this is a su significant problem, big cause of mortality in postoperative patients. Now, this is the simplified. If you want to remember this, go for it. I don't think you're going to be expected to know Wells criteria for any exam, you know, unless you're taking a general surgery board examination, I guess, or critical care or something. Uh, but uh, just bear this in mind. These are the risk factors and be aware of what those risk factors are. So when you're reading a vignette, um, you have an idea of, uh, of what might be going on. Now, if the spiral CT indicates that you're dealing with a pulmonary embolism, next you need to know, is the patient stable? If the patient is unstable or if they have a large pulmonary embolism, which we call saddle pulmonary embolism, you can consider a thrombolytic agent, um, then proceed with treatment as usual. If anticoagulation is contraindicated for one reason or another, and there's a number of reasons why it may be contraindicated, we're not going to go into that, um, then you can consider either a pulmonary embolectomy or the placement of an IVC filter. The treatment is going to be to provide supplemental oxygen. You'll start heparin. We're going to bridge them to warfarin. And then the reason that we do that is because we need to have them anticoagulated long term, three to six months at least. And then, of course, you're going to monitor the INR. It should be between two and three. This is the PESI criteria for pulmonary embolism. As you can see again here, when we're looking at a patient, it is a very, very, very low threshold to believe that they have a pulmonary embolism, that they have a high-risk pulmonary embolism. Um, so, uh, again, you don't need to memorize this, but just know these are sort of your risk factors of a low-risk PE versus a high-risk PE. On your exam, you're going to be given a high-risk PE. They're going to be straightforward with you. Now, this is the lower extremity venous circulation. It helps to know this. These veins are the veins that we're looking at for a DVT. Uh, and lower extremity is by far more common than upper extremity DVT. Now, we do this duplex ultrasound. I'm not going to go into all the details of how it's done, uh, but I do want to point out non-compressed and compressed. 
Um, in a DVT, the vein will not be compressible. So what you do is you take your you, you take your ultrasound, you look for the vein, you'll see the artery running right next to the vein, and you press them down. Now the artery is nice and thick walled, so it is not gonna compress, but the vein is thin walled, so it should compress. And it won't if you have a DVT. So let's take a look here. This is normal, okay? So this is just looking with the ultrasound probe. You can see that you've got your vein here and your artery here, I believe. Um, you'll know based on, uh, based on, um, on its appearance. It's, it's really hard to tell because I, I don't know what orientation this is in. Uh, but you can see here, so this is the artery and then this is the vein. Okay, so I guess I was right. So vein here, artery here. So here's your artery. Obviously, it does not compress, but the vein does. And if the vein will collapse, then you're not dealing with a DVT there. But you've got to, you've got to look at the whole leg. So you're not done yet. So here you can see with no compression, this is what it looks like. And then here you do apply compression and you see no collapsing. And what you're looking at here is, uh, is a DVT and it might actually be right here. All right, so this is looking at the popliteal vasculature. And then when you do the duplex, um, you'll be able to see the circulation and that will help you identify the clot. You can see that the, the venous blood is going right over that clot. And don't confuse red and blue with arterial and venous blood. It just depends on the orientation. It, your ultrasound is not gonna know artery versus vein blood. Superficial thrombophlebitis pretty much has all the risk factors as DVT. Um, additionally, there's varicose veins and certain IV drugs, uh, dilantin, phenytoin, and uh, calcium chloride can raise your risk as well. Now, people who have superficial thrombophlebitis are at higher risk for a DVT. Um, so that's important to keep in mind. The symptoms here are going to be quite different. They're gonna have tenderness over this sort of painful palpable cord. And that I put in yellow here. And the reason I did that is because that is uh, a buzzword for your exam. So you'll see this tender, firm, thickened vein, and it's like a cord. And often it's visible. Uh, there may be surrounding telangiectasias. For diagnosis, duplex ultrasound. Uh, you want to also check the deep veins because there can be a concomitant uh, DVT. The treatment provided there is no DVT is very simple. It's NSAIDs for pain and warm compress. Um, now also make sure they have prophylaxis for DVT. That's kind of a separate issue. We're always making sure our post-op patients have prophylaxis if they need it. And of course, if there's DVT, then you need to treat for that. So it can be as, as subtle as this, where you can kind of see the vein coming around here. This may not be palpable, but certainly if you're dealing with something like this, um, you will feel this palpable vein, this cord-like vein, and as you palpate it, they're going to tell you it hurts and it might also be warm because you're dealing with inflammation here. So you're gonna have all your cardinal signs of inflammation.